Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome back to the Fertility Confidence Podcast. A couple of weeks ago when I was recording our new male fertility program and our new mod male fertility module for FCM, we got this question that I thought to myself, man, we've actually never talked about that before. What a great idea to bring this to the podcast. So today we're talking about sperm agglutination. So if you've had a semen analysis done, you'll know that it's more than just number. It's more than just count. We get to know about the motility. We get to know about the morphology. And those three pieces, concentration, motility, and morphology, are the big three when it comes to sperm health that we want to know, we want to understand, we want to dig deeper into, but we actually get a little bit more information out of that semen analysis that we can pick apart and dive a little bit deeper. And one of those things is sperm agglutination, which is basically a fancy way of saying clumping. So when we see that agglutination is high or elevated, or they're witnessing it on the analysis, every lab reports this a little bit differently, which is incredibly frustrating as a practitioner that there isn't like gold standard or just one sheet of paper that every lab fills out and it's the exact same every single time because it's so hard sometimes <laughs> when you're looking at different reports from different places and they report or the way that they use their reference range or the wording that they use is slightly different. Um, so some labs use like a grading scale. Some labs just say yes, present or no. Um, and you have to kind of like take what you're given when you do your, your analysis, obviously. But what we're seeing when we see that agglutination is either present or moderate or high or whatever they're reporting it as, basically that means that they're seeing clumping amongst the sperm and they can clump at the head, they can clump the body, they can clump at the tail. And a lot of times I see uh, practitioners just kind of breezing past this as like, it's not a huge deal. And I think part of that comes from the premise that they're likely just going to refer you to do IUI or IVF anyways, nine times out of 10, depending on where you are in your journey, your age, yada, yada, yada. They're likely seeing it and saying like, well, we're going to do this anyway. So that no longer matters. But it does matter if you are doing timed intercourse, whether it's medicated or unmedicated, doesn't matter. This agglutination piece does matter. And I would argue that even if you're doing IUI or IVF, we still want to investigate this a little bit to see if there is a root cause issue that might give us more information that would play a role. So what does that look like? Why does this potentially happen? And taking a good thorough history is always really important because one of the reasons is a previous scrotal surgery. They see men that have had scrotal surgery have like a two times higher or three times higher amount of sperm agglutination. So wanting to see, okay, the surgery is something we cannot change, right? But it's an explanation for what's going on and it may help to make the decision of moving forward with various assisted reproductive technology techniques make sense, right? The big reason though is infection. And this is something we're really, I don't wanna use the term like pushing the narrative more on, but we're seeing more and more research coming out with the uterine microbiome and how that plays a significant role and uncovering more information to explain unexplained infertility, which we love. And the reality is, is that that microbiome piece, that like silent infection piece, we need to be looking at that in men as well because you guys could just be passing stuff back and forth to each other. So one of the causes of agglutination is actually it bacterial infection. Um, and we can see clumping happen with high levels of white blood cells. So if they are seeing white blood cells in the semen, we want to investigate where are those coming from? Why are they there? Most of the time we just empirically treat with antibiotics. And then you're going to want to do all the good stuff after with probiotics and re-inoculating. You'll want to retest and make sure that it actually cleared it up because sometimes one seven day course is just not enough. 
but we want to look deeper into that. And, and like I said, the more we're uncovering the layers of how the uterine microbiome plays a role and how silent infection and chronic endometritis is likely a high, of a higher prevalence in the infertility community than what is currently talked about because these women are, are currently lumped in the unexplained category. But you, women getting mycoplasma, urea plasma infections, men can get them as well. And it can come without symptoms and you can be passing it back and forth. So if you have gone down this road for yourself, the female, and have discovered chronic endometritis, urea plasma, mycoplasma, and you have not had your partner tested, please, please retest yourself, test your partner. These things can get transferred back and forth and we need to be treating both of you. It's really, really important. So ruling out infection and you can have infection without symptoms. I think that's another reason why this always kind of just gets like brushed off is people are like, well, I'm not sick. I don't have pain, but we are seeing positive results in clients that have no symptoms at all. So it's always, always important to look at that. The other thing is we can see agglutination with fever. So you do have some sort of virus, bacteria, whatever, illness that causes fever. We can see clumping happening with the elevated temperatures that does persist, but it that typically when it's a fever-induced agglutination will typically clear on its own. So if you have had a sperm analysis done, I do believe one of the questions they ask you is if you've had a fever in the last 30 days. And if you have, and you have some clumping agglutination white blood cells, my recommendation would be to just recheck in another 30 days because it's possible that that's, that abnormality is actually coming from the fever and it will correct itself. It's not necessarily pathological. I am so excited to open the doors for our Fertility Confidence Bootcamp for the first time in 2024, we are going live February 12th. We are live together for five days. And the best part about Fertility Confidence Bootcamp is it's not just another webinar that you're going to sign up for, maybe half-ass listen to, and then let it just simmer in your inbox for the rest of time. Yes, you have to come and listen to the information, but I promise you, you are going to walk away with tangible action steps to implement moving forward. In fact, if you actually do the implementation with me through the bootcamp week, we are gonna be giving away over $4,000 worth of prizes just for doing the work. So you aren't just gonna get the information, we are building out an action plan for you, for your fertility journey together with all of the support that we offer to our Fertility Confidence Method members. It is such a fun week. We absolutely love, love, love running bootcamp. And I hope that you can join me. All you need to do is head over to ttc.kelseyduncan.com slash bootcamp. And then the other piece is um, the clumping, the agglutination may also be an indicator of something called anti-sperm antibodies, which is basically your immune system creating antibodies against the sperm. And I don't know 100%, so don't quote me on this, I don't know if the antibodies like encase the sperm and that causes the clumping or they just kind of get all bound up in the antibodies so that it looks like clumping, I'm not really sure. But if the agglutination might be indicating the presence of anti-sperm antibodies. And this may be an immunological reason for infertility because it basically won't let the sperm survive and it won't let them swim properly. That's one of the biggest things with the agglutination is it's, it's likely making a huge impact with motility. And if you think about like, this is how I kind of picture it is in like a lazy river, right? And everyone's sitting in their their little inner tubes in the lazy river, which is such, such a funny thing to bring up because it was just like last week or the week before my seven-year-old was actually asking me what a lazy river was. And I was like, where did you even hear about this? I'm like, but they're awesome. <laughs> Let me tell you about the joys of a lazy river, son. Um, but picture a lazy river with all these inner tubes. And for a brief moment in time, a bunch of inner tubes kind of like get connected and then they come behind, more come behind, and they connect and connect and connect. And you basically have this big like section where no one can get through. 
that's kind of like what agglutination does. So even if there's other sperm that aren't in the clump that can swim quite well, if they can't navigate and get around because there's all these blockades through it, it's not going to be conducive to a, an optimized motility situation. So all that to say, if you are someone who has had scrotal surgery in the past, there is a chance that that leads to a higher uh, risk factor of agglutination. That is something we, we cannot change. How we would approach that is looking at other sperm health parameters, uh, making sure volume was good so that there's enough like thinned product in the semen to actually allow that clumping to maybe be a little bit less than if it was lower volume because higher concentrations, likely higher degree of clumping. And we would want to talk about, does doing IUI with a sperm wash make more sense for you, given what we know? Because it would actually help remove that poor sperm, that clumped up sperm. Fever, okay, likely short term, all right? So if you have had this done and you have had a fever, I would recommend before you get too concerned, up in arms, worried, moving forward with treatment, like let's just recheck and make sure that that's accurate. But the third piece, the big root cause that I think if the other two are checked off and not a factor on the table, but you haven't investigated the potential for infection, anti-sperm antibody, the immunological piece of this, I think that's a huge, huge barrier in care. And so we really want to make sure before we just step into IUI or IVF, we're actually digging deeper into that because those factors can still play a negative role. If you have that infectious piece, yes, okay, let's say you do an IUI, you do a sperm wash, it washes away the bad sperm, we are going to be left with better sperm. Is the quality impacted? Potentially, maybe, don't know for sure. But we're likely getting a better selection of sperm put closer to the fallopian tube in an IUI to do its job. Awesome. But the other side to that coin is, is if you do have the male portion of this factor has some sort of chronic infection, you're likely passing that on to your partner. And now we're opening up a whole nother can of worms in terms of where do we go from here with treatment. And there, and we should not be investing in IUI or IVF if there's the potential for that chronic infection and endometritis and dysregulated uterine microbiome because we're, we're literally wasting money and, and hope and time. We don't want that, right? We want like the literal exact opposite of that. So that's why sperm agglutination is important. It Truthfully, it's not something we see all that often. So it's not like, you know, 50% of semen analysis we look at, which is, you know, lots throughout the month, we're seeing this over and over and over again. It's not, it's not a very common piece, but if it's there and it's being ignored or brushed aside, I want you to really, really advocate to dig deeper because especially if you guys have been told you have unexplained infertility, or if you've been told that everything looks good, this could potentially be that box that you've been looking for, that like golden ticket you've been looking for in terms of really, really understanding not just what's wrong, but how to actually treat it to get pregnant versus just trying a bunch of things and hoping for the best, which is not why you guys are listening <laughs> to me on this podcast, right? Because that's not what we do here. We want to find that root cause piece. And then we want to give you well-researched backed solutions that are truly going to optimize your fertility and not just guess. So hopefully that is helpful. I will be back here next week. I hope you guys have a beautiful week. As always, thank you so much for subscribing and leaving your reviews. Every time you do that, it helps the podcast grow and get into the hands of couples that need this information that don't know where to look. So from the bottom of my heart, it helps me not just grow my voice, but I know that we are, we are getting in the ears of people that need this support just like you do. And so thank you for paying it forward. I greatly appreciate it and I will see you guys in the next episode.